by Kurtan Partners and Speaker and Jäger uh, law firm from Germany. And thank you. to time for uh, with us thank you thomas for taking time and uh, being with us today Give me a second my absolute pleasure <laughs> thank you thank you thank you uh, dear all let me introduce uh, the topic very briefly then i'll leave the floor to thomas um as we all know, the global, uh, globalized economy, while global supply chain can offer important opportunities uh, for economic and social development, they also often present serious risks and variations uh, for human rights and environment as well. Therefore, this issue has started to be discussed in terms of international and local uh, requirements and uh, from the legal requirements perspective by the lawmakers. So, uh, such as international conventions, UN guides, uh, guides about uh, human rights and EU directives about it, and at the end, and actually just uh, before the EU directive in force, German Supply Chain uh, Due Diligence Act has already announced and will be enforced in the very near future, which is at the beginning of 2003. With these regulations, institutions and organizations mainly aims creating an obligation for businesses to conduct human rights and environment due, due diligence at the low level of supply chain. Why this is important? Let me uh, let me please show you some numbers, then uh, I'll close my presentation. Um, these numbers are from 2002. Uh, top three exports partners of Turkey is listed here. And as you will see that Germany is mostly in all, all the years, usually Germany is taking the first place. And very recently, after the uh, some changes, global changes, uh, two and third is changing. Now China and um, more Eastern countries and even Russia is taking the place, but Germany all the time taking the first place. So that's why this law is more important than uh, the other countries for Turkey supply chain uh, actors in Turkey. Uh, Especially automotive sector is a very important item from the expert perspective with our uh, partnership relationship with the uh, German companies and Is a hundred percent or as part of the information spare part automotive spare part producers in Turkey with more than 500 producers and more 500 companies. So, uh, out of these 500 companies, uh, 26 companies uh, are hundred percent German or German partnership, having a German or German partnership. Uh, five companies having a production facilities in Germany and with the huge number 272 companies with the current numbers supplying to Germany. Therefore uh, this act will uh, really um, uh, has an impact on Turkish supply uh, sector in Turkey. Therefore um, there will be some changes, some requirements uh, to be expected for the Turkish company. Uh, Thomas, floor is yours. Uh, please feel free to explain the detail of the uh, law and Im expected impact of the uh, law on Tur Turkish companies and other exporters. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, to start with, uh, um, I have prepared a handout for you. Uh, um, I just I post the PDF into the chat of uh, into the team's chat. You can download it uh, from our website. Uh, it's my I'm sorry to, to interrupt Thomas, but I forgot to remind that we are recording it because of the data protection perspective. We have to mention that. Sorry about that. Um, hooray. Uh, um, so uh, um, this is recorded. 
and you find uh, the download for the handout uh, in the chat window. Um, let me quickly start um, uh, the presentation. And here we go. Um, our topic today is the German Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. Um, just some quick words uh, to me. Before I became a lawyer, I've been a lecturer for European business law. And as such a lecturer on European business law, I spent uh, a lot of summers in Istanbul. So um, I passed this very beautiful gate uh, quite often. So uh, I'm very pleased and I really like it to present uh, to you today. Nowadays, I am a lawyer in Dortmund, Germany, um, renowned for football, uh, steel, and so on and so forth. Spieker and Jäger is a um, full-service law firm for large and medium-sized companies. We are 25 lawyers, six notaries, and of course, uh, we are here to help. The Supply Chain Due Diligence Act. Um, there's a story behind it, and I just want to give you the story how all of this came along. Um, it starts, uh, funnily enough, in Germany. Um, the background uh, to this act is as follows. Um, in 2012, there was in Pakistan uh, a clothes factory which was destroyed by fire. Uh, 260 people died, uh, close to uh, 1,000 people were injured, and uh, the only use of that company was uh, to produce clothing for a German clothes retailer. And this German clothes retailer is actually from Dortmund. So this retailer got sued in Dortmund Regional Court, and the court found that um, the claims of uh, the, the surviving relatives and the injured parties of this Pakistan fire were time barred. So um, they didn't get anything out of it. And of course, uh, this was some kind of, uh, let's call it scandal, or at least it made some waves here in Germany. This is the one part of the background. There is a second one, and this goes as follows. The United Nations do attempt for quite some time to improve the situation of workers in foreign manufacturing locations and to shape um, some kind of corporate governance of foreign companies in other countries. We call that the United Nations Global Compact. And this global compact should have had resulted in national action plans. And of course, Germany adhered um, to this national action plan. And the original plan was that the company uh, shall do that voluntarily. In 2018, um, the coalition agreement between the big German parties held um, that there should be no law, that there should be no act only in the case uh, that companies do not uh, implement the national action plan by themselves. Now, unsurprisingly, they did not. So um, this was uh, the birthplace of um, this supply chain due diligence act. The general idea was to um, formulate German rules for a responsible corporate governance and um, the protection of human rights and environment within the supply chain. Um, the major issue here is preventive or remedial action in this supply chain. The act got parliament's approval in July 2021, and it will apply from New Year's Eve, so January 1st. When we're talking about uh, a German act, um, first of all, of course, we have to look at the personal scope. And I think this is also most interesting to you. Um, it's as follows. The Supply Chain Act um, applies to all companies which are domiciled in Germany. So you can say German companies. But um, if your company has a domicile in Germany, it will apply as well. So it also applies to foreign companies with a branch or subsidiary in Germany. Um, there is a threshold with regard to the number of employees. Um, from the 1st of January 2023, it will only apply to companies with more than 3,000 employees. From January 2024, it will apply also to companies with 1,000 employees. Of course, this is the German side and might be initially not your problem. However, the Act uh, addresses the whole supply chain. 
So we have to look into what actually the supply chain is according to the Act. And here the problems start. Um, the first three year is, uh, um, of course, the supply chain is everything. Uh, it starts with the company's uh, products and services, and it covers all the steps also internationally to produce those products and to provide the services. So it starts with the extraction of raw materials, maybe somewhere in China, and it ends with the delivery to the co customer. Okay, this is quite a big scope when we talk about the supply chain. If we look into the act more specifically, of course, uh, um, first of all, there is the own area of business. So this will usually be a German company. OK, and the act uh, um, applies to any activity within the company's objective. No problem there. The problem starts here. Uh, um, the company uh, and the act also address direct suppliers. So any party to a contract which supply the goods for that company. Remember, it's a supply chain. So um, it will the act the company, the German company in the starting point, and there are um, legal provisions for the direct supplier. OK, the act also addresses the next step indirect suppliers. So every every step from the company itself to anybody apart is included in the act itself. OK, this is the supply chain what they want to do, what are the objectives of this German act. Now, quite obviously, from the Pakistan example, um, the act addresses human rights and honestly, quite a lot of them. Um, the company and uh, the direct and indirect supplier have due diligence obligations uh, with a view to risks to human rights. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, the, neither the company nor the direct suppliers nor the indirect suppliers shall employ children under the age of 15 years old, um, which is not a problem uh, in, in Europe. Uh, um, but for instance, uh, we're running quite a large uh, law firm here. Um, we have uh, producers which are producing, for instance, in the Far East, um, in Africa, and so on and so forth. And there it will be a problem. Um, it is prohibited to the company, the direct and indirect suppliers, to employ a person in forced labor. Um, there is a prohibition for all forms of slavery, slavery-like practices. Um, there is a prohibition, and it's quite interesting, for any violation of a labor protection law at the location of the employment. Um, interestingly enough, there is uh, a prohibition, or uh, I put it differently, um, the company, the direct and indirect supplier, should regard the freedom of coalition. So labor unions are protected under this German law, okay? Um, the German law protects uh, strikes or collective negotiations, so it goes quite far. Um, there's also uh, a prohibition on unequal treatment due to origin, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and so on and so forth. There's a prohibition to withhold a fair wage. So um, the company, the direct and indirect suppliers, must guarantee a procedure to uh, pay at least minimum wage. Um, there are prohibitions on uh, forced expropriations or evictions, which uh, might become important to everybody who extracts raw materials. Um, usually people live where there's coal and steel in the ground, and uh, this is the case in Germany as well. Um, those people are evicted. This is covered under the Act. Um, finally, um, there is a prohibition for the use of uh, private security forces uh, when those private security forces employ torture or cruel or inhuman treatment. Um, this is quite a list, actually, uh, and um, this will result uh, foreseeably 
and problems. This is the one part of the objectives. There's another part because the environment and the protection of the environment, you may know we've got a green government in Germany now, is also covered. Um, you may recognize the park from this picture. It's from Istanbul. Um, so um, the act also covers environmental risk. Uh, and again, this is quite far fetching. Um, it is prohibited to contaminate soil, water, air, or to uh, have excessive water consumption. And quite specifically, uh, it's prohibited to use mercury because there was a public international treaty on the prohibition of use of mercury. Um, it's prohibited to use organic pollutants and um, you have to handle waste uh, uh, environmental friendly. Most of you will know by now that there are quite some European directives on this topic as well. And I, I guess a lot of German companies contacted you within the last year uh, on the waste handling issues. Now, um, what we know now is what is the supply chain and what are, what are the objectives to be um, protected? Now, what is that the company has to do? So what are the company's obligations under this German act? Um, it's very German. Uh, to be honest, it's a very German act. Um, first of all, the company is obliged to do a risk analysis. Uh, so the company has to identify human rights and environmental risk within the supply chain. And to identify those, those risks, they will contact you. These risks have to be then assessed and prioritized, whatever that means. We don't know yet, uh, but we will find out. Then the company must draw conclusions. These conclusions of the risks must then be communicated within the company. And again, very German, this risk analysis must be done once a year, okay, or whenever appropriate, but at least once a year is the risk analysis. Then the company has to do, based on this risk analysis, a policy statement, um, a code of conduct, actually. In this policy statement, there must be strategies laid down in the own business area of the company. And here it gets tricky, strategies of the direct supplier. So German companies will contact you and ask you for your strategies to protect human rights and to protect the environment um, because they have to do it and they're allowed to ask you. So you have to produce at least some paper and some meaningful strategy. Um, there must be some kind of description of a compliance procedure. Um, there must be uh, identification of human rights uh, and our environmental risks. And you have to lay down expectations vis-a-vis -vis your employees, and this extends to, to uh, the supply chain as such, so to direct suppliers as well. The company has to take preventive measures. So uh, when you have identified the risk and laid down a strategy, you have to do, uh, uh, within your strategy, you have to lay down what preventive measures uh, are we taking that there are no uh, violations of human rights and that there are no violations of environmental uh, of the environment. So um, the, the legislator says uh, training. So um, you have to promise some kind of training of your employees. You have to promise audits, what I describe here as risk-based control. So uh, audits will be in there. Um, these measures, the German companies are now forced to implement these measures vis-a-vis uh, -vis the direct suppliers. Um, this is now uh, in the statute itself. So in the strategy paper of the German company, um, you will find from the 1st of January some kind of selection procedures of suppliers based on protection of human rights and protection of environment. The German companies will ask you for uh, contractual guarantees that human rights and environment are protected by you as the uh, as direct supplier. And uh, um, they will 
ask to provide training and they will ask to uh, uh, for audits with a view to environmental protection and human rights. This is what will happen uh, uh, from the 1st of January. What also has to be implemented is um, what also has to be implemented is a complaints procedure. That means uh, uh, you have to protect whistleblowers. Um, you've, you might have heard of that. Uh, it's within the European Union as well. So there must be an internal complaints procedure. And what's important to you is the company, the German company itself must have such a whistleblowing procedure, but also for their suppliers. So the German companies will now implement a whistleblowing procedure for you, the direct suppliers, as well. Um, they will contact you, I guess. Um, and then the German companies have to do uh, an information, a public information on this whistleblowing procedures. And then they have to guarantee uh, impartial, independent and confidential trade treatment and so on and so forth. If, and now uh, I think it gets really important, if human rights or the environment are uh, violated, the, uh, the act asks for remedial measures. What, what is meant by that? Um, within the controlling sphere of the German company and extending to direct suppliers, if there is a violation of human rights or uh, the environment, um, there must be, first of all, very German, there must be a concept to, to, to end this violation. Okay, first of all, uh, um, this concept must be very precise. The strategy must be precise. Um, you have to come up with a plan to, to end the, the violation of human rights. If, if the plan fails, uh, the German company is, is forced to terminate, uh, to end the contract with the direct supplier. This is now what is in this act. So if there is a human rights violation or a violation of the environment by a direct supplier, the German company is asked, is forced by law to end the contractual relationship with that direct supplier. Um, Indirect suppliers are, of course, not, you cannot control indirect suppliers. You don't have a contract with that indirect supplier. So uh, the, the Act only asks for a risk analysis and, honestly, an angry letter. Okay, this is indirect suppliers. Um, I have mentioned this is a very German Act. And as you may have realized, Germans like their paperwork. And of course, in this act, uh, it's paperwork as well. The German companies, but also you as their direct supplier, have to do quite extensive documentation and reporting. Um, first of all, uh, you have to do an annual report. And this annual report must be kept for seven years and must be published on the website. To be precise here, the German company has to do an annual report um, and the German company has to make this annual report available on their website uh, for seven years. The, what, what is in that annual report? Uh, a lot of my clients ask me. And um, basically uh, what I've told you, uh, what risks were identified, uh, what was done to prevent those risks, and what are we doing in the future? This this will not happen again. Basically, that's it. And yet again, I, I promise you, the German companies will contact you to help with that report. Um, this is what will happen inevitably. OK, this report must be sent uh, to the Federal Office of Economics and Export Control, the BAFA. And the BAFA becomes now very, very, and the BAFA will keep that report, I guess, forever. Um, and the BAFA will become very, very important now because the BAFA will do the enforcement um, 
of of uh, the, the act itself. And they've got some uh, very, very interesting measures. First of all, if the German company, if there is a violation and the German company does not react, the BAFA can do fines up to 2% of the company's annual turnover. Um, I, I, I learned that your automotive suppliers, um, maybe you want to look at the annual turnover of VW. 2% is a large sum there. This is the one part. The other part is uh, BAFA can exclude the company from public procurement. That means uh, this German state as such buys a lot of stuff, uh, including cars. And uh, we call this procedure public procurement. So the company violating the act uh, um, will not be able to sell to the German state for up to three years. Um, again, for V, um, approximately 10 to 15 percent of for V, of for these cars, are sold to the German state. Um, I don't think they want to lose that share. Um, funnily enough, under uh, uh, under the German Act as of now, there is no civil liability. That means. Uh, if somebody whose <coughs> human rights are violated or uh, if um, there is an uh, environmental damage, those people cannot sue under the act as it stands. But there is a, a very, very recent uh, development, six days old, um, on the European level. Because the Council of the European Union has agreed on a supply chain directive uh, on December 1st. And the supply chain directive is basically um, the act I just presented, but uh, uh, with a lower threshold. Um, it will apply to 500, uh, to, to all companies with 500 employees and a turnover of 150 million a year. However, in risk sectors, it's 250 employees and 20 million a year. So rather small companies. And the risk sectors are textile, clothing, obviously, agriculture, obviously, food, raw material extraction and metal processing. And uh, metal processing um, sounds strange, but on a European level, automotive parts are metal processing. Um, under the directive, as it stands right now, human rights violations uh, will be liable under civil law and, this is important, for all suppliers. So the main risk may be that you, as a Turkish company, as a direct supplier, will be sued somewhere in Europe for civil liability, for damages due to a human rights violation by a Pakistan party. Okay? Uh, this is the development there. The European, European Parliament will vote on that in May 23. And uh, by all means, I think the European Parliament will make the directive not easier for anyone. Good. Basically, uh, um, this is a quick, I, I, I'm, I'm quite sure, quite a uh, very quick run through uh, um, where we are currently and of course i'm more than happy to to answer any questions uh, you may have thank you thomas uh, it's been very informative and as we discussed earlier uh, this is very new rules new law so that it will be affected uh, from the new year, as you mentioned. So we may not know the details of the application yet. Yes. Obviously, we, we have no decisions. Uh, we, we have nothing. We have the act and mm -hmm. uh, we have German companies who have to do something, but they don't know either. And Indeed, of course, uh, the uh, suppliers out of Germany, uh, they wouldn't know either. So, uh, but every every uh, supply chain companies are uh, related to in some way to German companies. Um, they should be aware of that. Uh, as as far as I understand from your presentation, we have a new uh, new, new era. Uh, 
and will have a new uh, quite long and detailed uh, compliance requirements are in, in the near future waiting for us, don't you think so? Yes, uh, um, definitely. So um, um, the German companies will have contacted you with code of conduct, uh, um, with audits and so on and so forth. And uh, um, all that will become more aggressive because, uh, uh, of course, there are the fines. This is the one part. The other part is uh, um, you will have to guarantee uh, that there are no violations of human rights and the environment in your supply chain. And uh, this is a tricky bit, to be very honest. Uh, um, and this is what will happen. Definitely. And um, as you just mentioned a um, couple of times that this act has a quite strong German character. But yes. you... <laughs> I mean, because of the documentation and rules and etc., it's so obvious, and we are all expect that. But uh, at the same time, the EU has the very similar regulation, different thresholds and etc. But the idea is the same at least. So, um, do you think that the EU application would be easier or less German than the your application? Uh, um, Would you expect that? No, no, uh, uh, um, uh, no, it will be, first of all, stricter. So it will be worse, uh, uh, to okay. be very honest. And um, it is, a, as it planned right now, uh, it is a directive. So um, the implementation is left to the member states. Uh, so it oh. will get, it will get worse. Uh, um, I'm, I'm absolutely sure. Um, because, uh, to be yet again very honest, economic ideas or, or the, the larger scheme of economics are not relevant to the European Parliament. Um, they right. don't look at, at any uh, economic reasons right. uh, in any way because they are not bound by, by the member states. So uh, I guess they will disregard business interests even more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, there is one uh, main point that uh, I, I, I have a curiosity about it. As you know, uh, in some uh, EU uh, applications, there, there is the arms and length principle that we experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that BAFA has taken a, a position like that in some point, arms and length? And do, do you think that they will be contracting to companies outside Germany directly or with regard to finding or reporting? Would you expect anything like Buffer, that? BAFA will contact the German companies and um, BAFA will... Uh, um, will be very aggressive. In the very beginning, BAFA will be very aggressive uh, um, to implement that act. They have the manpower and um, again, you know, Germans. Um, this is the first part. It will get better in two or three years when we know what they are doing. But uh, first of all, BAFA has to find itself. And um, for the German companies, the only proper reaction is to give the aggression to the next one. They will turn around and go to the direct suppliers uh, and um, then we will see what will happen. But uh, um, my best guess is they will ask the direct suppliers for um, the information they need for BAFA. Okay. This is the general right. idea. Uh, and okay. Of course, uh, um, I think this is the way it will proceed. Mm -hmm. This is what we expect. Okay, and um, as we all know that, uh, at least in Turkey, uh, we have very strict environmental law, employment law, with these human rights regulations and etc. And many of the companies uh, we we know in automotive sector that uh, they they are meeting this criteria. There are some certificates that they take regularly, and they have to take anyway. So in in, in at a some for uh, for some point, they are already ready for this kind of audits and requirements anyway. 
do you think that German companies will ask uh, or will uh, will be enough to to see this um, local reports and etc or do you think that they may expect uh, from the Turkish companies to fulfill requirements based on EU certificates, EU requirements, and etc. Um, uh, have, I spent quite some time in Turkey. Uh, um, so I'm fully aware the Turkish employment law and Turkish environmental law is fine, full stop. Okay. If you have documentation uh, um, for the Turkish company, the first step is fine. The problem here is um, you have you have the, the Turkish company, the direct supplier, must bring a, a documentation from their direct suppliers. You know, it's a supply chain. Right. Uh, so if you buy a product abroad, you may have a problem. This is this is I think this is what I identify here initially. Um, you will have, uh, if if you have human rights and uh, environment addressed already um, in your reports, um, it's a lot of compliance stuff these days, I do know, um, then maybe it's fine. So as, as a strategy, um, give to the German companies everything you've got. Uh, um, and then let's have a look if it is enough. Uh, most probably they will come along with a list of questions. You can always refer uh, to Turkish employment and environmental law and you would adhere to those standards, uh, which are fine. Full stop. OK, thank you. Yeah. This is this is important for companies in Turkey also. Um, and also uh, one very uh, one question from your experience uh, from the practice with other laws and applications, actually. Do you think that German companies will do the audits, expected audits, yours, they, they, they self, or they would uh, go with the uh, neutral audit companies or international audit companies, we all yeah. know, or law firms? What do you expect that? Uh... <laughs> Uh, in all the contracts I do, I uh, always cross out anything. Uh, uh, my company is not my my client's company is not visited uh, by anyone who's not neutral. This is, you know, uh, <laughs> this is important. Uh, um, answer. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't want to see anyone who could be a competitor. In my company, they, you know, uh, keep your nose out. Uh, um, there are international companies. I think uh, the large German companies will hire those and uh, will send them over. Send them over is the wrong one because I know all of them are available in Istanbul. In, in Turkey, yes, that's yes, right. Yes, they are there. Right. So uh, um, the chances are, and this is my prediction, the, the big German companies will come along and ask for, first of all, uh, some kinds uh, of, of report from your part uh, for the right to audit uh, and a contractual guarantee. Um, we all know, I think, these big uh, SAP um, uh, programs where you can bid on, on a certain part in the automotive sector. And there are, uh, I think the rules there will change on the 1st of January. You will see, you always have to click them away, obviously. Uh, um, uh, these rules will change. And I recommend to have a look, right? In any case, any auditor should be neutral okay. whenever possible, please. Okay, thank you. And before uh, reading the question uh, sent uh, from the chat, I, I would like to ask my last question. Um, do we have any... A sample documentation uh, already in German practice, or the Turkish company should uh, rebuild their uh, their audit reports and etc. About that, and mm. how the law lawyers should take a role on that. Uh, Bafa has published uh, um, two weeks ago a sample report. Um, this sample report is uh, only relevant to the German companies. Um, of course, my best guess is they will hand on that sample report. Um, the sample report is very short. 
it's a, <laughs> I, I it's you can take my presentation uh, and uh, <laughs> it, it, the December report is very short um so the Germans lawyers uh the, the Germans compliance officers don't really know what to do right now uh, um this was then uh, given to BAFA and the crit criticism to BAFA was very loud mm -hmm. and uh, um my best guess is within the next two weeks they will produce a, a bigger sample report. Um, important is in that regard, uh, um, the sample report must not be done on January 1st. It must be done by the end of next year. And right. during the next year, we will step around BAFA and what you want, what is fine, what do we have to do? Right. Um, this is work in progress. The reports are due end of uh, uh, end of next year for most companies. And this is just uh, a heads up, a warning to you. Uh, they will come along and ask for stuff. OK, we, we need to get ready then. <laughs> we, we have time to to study hard on that. Uh, OK. Uh, would, you, would you like me to, to read some questions provided through the chat? I, I, I see those questions. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So the first one is, will there be any audits to be done in regards to verify that the new law is being implemented within the complete supply chain? By whom and how? Um, yes, there will be audits um, at the direct suppliers. This is provided in the law. And as mentioned, this will most probably be done by neutral audit companies. Um, this is uh, this is it. Uh, um, I think this is the way uh, they will proceed. Uh, I, I, I think uh, this is how it's done. If you are a subsidiary of a Turkish company in Germany with an employee smaller than a thousand, do you still need to publish a report? No. You, you, you're done. Uh, um, as for the, you are then a German company from the from the legal perspective. Uh, um, if if there are less than a thousand people in the German company, you're fine. However, you may still be a, a direct supplier to a German company, and then of course uh, the whole thing starts again. Uh, um, but generally, if there are less than a thousand people, you're you're out. Um, but it Thomas, sorry, at that point we have to remind that if you are uh, supplying to Germany only, that's fine. But if you are supplying to other EU countries, the EU threshold is lower than lower. a thousand. Yeah. So, uh, so you, you need to bear in mind that. The EU threshold will be 250. 250, yeah. Nothing, uh, to be very honest here. Um, what encompasses uh, the violation of human rights and the implementation of the act? Um, basically, the points I mentioned, um, the general idea here, or what the German legislator did, is take public international law treaties uh, in human rights. And they took all of them, uh, anything they could find, uh, which is public international law, uh, so treaties, um, and which encompass human rights. This is basically, uh, and then I just gave you a list. You have it in the handout. It's children's, uh, it's slavery, it's uh, workers' unions, and all that stuff. This uh, is what is encompassed here. Um, will the studies be uh, evaluated only within the framework of metalworks and automotive, or will plastic components be evaluated, including in scope? Um, this is for the European Union, uh, which will come along in May next year, and we don't know yet. Uh, um, the, we only got the information that they agreed on the directive, but we, we don't know yet uh, what it will be precisely. We don't have a text yet, okay? Um, in Germany, we don't, under the German Act, um, it doesn't matter in which industry you are. Everything is covered. Um, is a direct supplier obliged to provide the, the relevant annual report in the same context as German companies? Technically, no. Practically, yes. Because uh, uh, the German company will ask you for your evaluation, for your risk assessment, for what you are doing for human rights and environment. 
So, no, you're not obliged to hand, as a Turkish company, you're not obliged uh, to hand anything to BAFA. But the only chance for the German company to get the information is get it from you. And they have to get it, they have to include the direct supplier. The, the direct supplier must be in the annual report. They can come along uh, and check your company, but you will not allow that. So they will ask you for that information. Um, what, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, yeah. at that point, probably there will be some changes on contracts because with the other reason like quality, quality audits and etc in the contracts we we experience that they may come to time to time and make uh, physical audits in turkish companies so yeah. we may expect some this kind of physical audits in the future maybe Absolutely. Or, or if in any any specific situations they may have a right to come and come and check I absolutely agree. Um, they ask for more information. They will ask for guarantees and they will ask for audit rights. This is sure. what they're going to do. Um, OK, um, would a Turkish direct supplier need a representative located in Germany in the scope of this act? No, you don't. You don't. Uh, uh, of course, as a German lawyer. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, um, no, you don't. You don't need a German representative. And um, the German companies will uh, usually they have a representative in, in Turkey. Any larger German com com company has a representative there. Um, but you don't need one. Uh, of course, I always uh, recommend uh, the interlegal network, which is there. And we know each other due to the interlegal network. Um, there are good legal networks you can always rely on. Um, does Meta in confirmation as uh, Smeta S M E I T A is a, a Turkish uh, compliance uh, company. Is that correct? Yes. The, okay. Uh, enough for the slides. Or would be the any other audits? Excellent question. Um, this depends on the German company. Um, I, we don't know yet, and uh, we can. I cannot honestly answer what threshold, what quality uh, the German company will expect from you. Uh, it could be the case, best case scenario is you will sign a guarantee that you will uh, protect all human rights and the environment every living second of your life, and it's done. This is the best case. The worst case scenario is you will sign that guarantee, you will send over a millions of pages of some information, and they will still come along uh, with an auditor. Both scenarios are absolutely possible, and it all depends how BAFA uh, will will uh, act next year. Uh, um, it, it will be somewhere in the middle. Okay, good. In automotive industry, there are plenty of regulations regarding human rights. Yes, there is. And environmental issues. Yes, there are. Uh, what will this act bring changes in the course of business other than fines? Um, uh, uh, paperwork is my very honest answer, uh, especially in automotive industry. Um, there are a lot of regulations and uh, as, uh, from my perspective, it's all protected uh, perfectly fine. Um, however, so far uh, you didn't have to produce the paperwork for BAFA uh, to guarantee and to explain what you are doing there. Uh, um, and this will definitely change. This is one part. And the other part is, uh, um, this, is uh, um, in, this is automotive industry. You've got suppliers as well. And uh, your suppliers, so where do you get the steel from? Where do you, where you get your, your, your materials from? These suppliers are now included as well. And this wasn't the case beforehand. OK. I, I, I think I, if there are any questions, uh, uh, um, we are here, to be very honest. Uh, uh, Aslam is here. I am here. Uh, um, you've got our contacts. Uh, don't hesitate. Uh, just 
contact us, ask us. We're here to answer questions. This is basically our job. Um, Thomas, thank you very much. Thank you for your a kind approach and friendly approach and uh, for inform informative presentation as we ex explain both explain at the beginning that this is a new rules and yes. uh, we we may not the i mean not may not we we are we, we don't know the exact practice how it will uh, react uh, to us so we are here uh, any any time if you need any any help I'm happy to cooperate with thomas and uh, provide it to you and by the way uh, we have some uh, some people uh, joined later on so uh, thomas has already uh, sorry, and we, you can also contact Jay Hanum, that she can also provide it to you. Thank you for handout also, Thomas. It, it will be really helpful. And we'll be in contact for the future applications requirements, probably, because we'll have a new era to work on it. There will be certainly an update. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll do that time to time. OK. Um, thank you very much, Merba. Dr. Thomas Tiedi. Thank you very much from uh, Shpiker and Jäger. Uh, and thank you for all the uh, listeners uh, joined us today because it was, it's been a really big number. Thank you for your kind interest and thank to Taisat also for uh, giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.